I don't want to have favorite speakers, but Sean's one of my favorites too. Um, uh, we met um, uh, on the TEDx stage actually a few years ago and have been sort of hanging out ever since. Um, he's originally from New Zealand, but now based in San Francisco, where he's co-founder and CTO of Quid, um, an augmented intelligence company. He is, you, I'm going to read this list, and then you'll just see basically he's an overachiever. He is a physicist, a Rhodes Scholar, obtaining his PhD from Oxford on the mathematical platforms that underlie modern war. Um, and this research has literally taken him all over the world, from the Pentagon to the United Nations and Iraq. And he's often on, is it CNN? I always see on the American News talking about war and cool stuff. So um, he has had a past life, however. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of rivalry and competition between Sean and I. Sean was a fellow nanotechnologist. He used to be one of us, and then he switched, um, who used to work at NASA, keeping the rocket theme, um, on self-repairing nanocircuits. And therefore, we have three rocket themes today. That was number two. Um, he has a huge list of massive successes, and not just in business, but also in sports as a two-time former national decathlon champion. Now, I was like, okay, whatever. I bet you're not that good. <laughs> so we went on, you know those nice cycle, rent a bike, go around Waiheke, drink some wine tours? Two A-type personalities who are sporty nuts did that wine tour on bikes. It just, I don't think we drank any wine. I think we literally raced each other around the whole island and we missed the winery. And we actually got called back by the event organizers being like, we saw you guys. <laughs> and you, you cycled past the winery and you kept going. And I'm like, because I'm winning. <laughs> so anyway, uh, as well as his athletic prowess and quid, he's, um, he's a super fun exciting guy to be working with. And I think the thing that's made me most jealous this year from Sean um, was the fact that he got to work with Morgan Freeman. I know. <laughs> um, on sharing his research off on the TV show Through the Wormhole. So if you haven't seen that, Google it. It's pretty awesome. And Morgan Freeman is one of those amazing people, as is Sean Gawley, who is our next speaker. Sean. <laughs> That'll work. All right. Um, <laughs> let's get that there. Um, thanks, Michelle. I don't, I don't really know how to respond to that. But um, if you ever get the chance to have Morgan Freeman for a few minutes, you should do one thing, um, absolutely, and that's get him to leave a voice message on your phone because <laughs> you, really, you really can't go past being uh, introduced uh, by Morgan Freeman on the thing. I would also kind of um, put the caveat on that bike racing. Um, you know, you go to Waikiki Island, you, you do the kind of the tour around, right? Um, you're supposed, supposed to be leisurely, right? She showed up with a racing bike. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, at that point it was on. Um, I want to um, run through uh, Vaughan, Sean. Here we go. Brilliant. Um, I want to start with this. Because um, this thing, for me, really sums up the year that we've had um, at Quid. Um, it's been a year of selling. It's been a year of uh, getting up and pitching people time and time and time again into the big companies, the big governments, the big hedge funds um, around the world. It's something that I think when I started um, Quid, I never really had the sense that that's what the company would actually be doing, um, would be selling. Um, you always think it's, you're gonna build a team, you're gonna build technology, you're gonna build the product. You never realize that at some point you're just selling the thing the whole time. Um, but it's been a wonderful thing because for me coming into it, I was like, I'm not really a salesperson. Right, you know, I'm, it's like selling's for other people. I, I don't like getting told no, so I'm not, probably not a very good person, and I really don't like asking for money because it's kind of awkward. <laughs> right? So for me, going through this, I think is 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 kind of been a couple of things. One is you realize when you build a company, you ultimately you sell stuff, which should have probably occurred at the start of it. But secondly, it, it realizes too is I think we have stories that tell ourselves about what we're good at and what we're not good at, where our strengths are and where they're not. And for me, it was always, well, I do technical, but I don't do selling. And I think coming through this year, I think I've, I've, I've earned my selling badge um, at the very least. And so we've, we've closed the year out and I get a, a little bit of time now in New Zealand to, um, to take a bit of a break and just absolutely thrilled. We did 8.5 million of subscription sales this year with the first full year of the software on the market. And so for me, that just represents kind of a huge milestone of creating software and having it out and deployed with the sales team and kind of hitting our number. A number for the year was eight million, which um, to kind of go past that was really, really fantastic. So thank you. <laughs> um, 
but it was also important to come back to New Zealand. So when um, I was chatting with Scott about coming down here, it was um, the single most important thing. I said, yeah, I've got to get down to New Zealand. He said, you know, why have we got to get down here? I said, for me, it just gives me a chance to take a break from that whole circus in Silicon Valley and just get out on the surfboard um, back in Christchurch and just think about where we've come from, think about the next year where we're going, but also think some different ideas. And I think um, it's, it's so nice to be able to come home to New Zealand and take that time and that space. So I want to kind of share some of that stuff that's on my mind as I think forward towards the next year and kind of share some of that with you. I, I, I thought about maybe like saying, well, I could tell you about how to build companies, but I think honestly, if you were looking at advice from me, it's probably the wrong person. I think I've probably made most of the mistakes and I always think it's funny when someone says, how do you do this stuff? I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. Um, but I do have um, some interesting thoughts I think you'll like on um, this. So this for me has been fascinating, the human brain. Um, and particularly the limits of the human brain. What, what it can do, but also what it can't do. And I think we tend to think that it's infinite, right? We've got infinite capacity in the way we can think. But there are very, 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 very real limits in what we can do. And one of these is the speed of thought, right? So we can think only so fast. And scientists got together and they measured this. And they said, well, how fast can you think? And they took a bunch of chess players and they stuck them into an fMRI machine and, and started to measure the time that they would uh, react to whether the board was in check or not. And they found that um, the uh, experts could do it in about 650 milliseconds and the, uh, the amateurs about 900 milliseconds, right? So no matter how good you were at chess, you couldn't think faster than 650 milliseconds as to whether the king was in check or not. And this sort of represented the smallest atomic unit of strategic thought. So the human brain can't think faster than 0.65, which is about this long, right? That we don't exist below that. And it seems kind of trivial, right? It seems like that shouldn't really make a big difference to anything. Except um, this is what happens because of that little um, limit in our cognitive processing power. Um, today, we're looking about 65% of all US equities are traded by algorithms. And they're traded by algorithms because algorithms can think a whole lot faster than that. And now, instead of you know, looking at people trading stocks backwards and forwards, it's a bunch of servers um, <laughs> co-located to be as near as possible to the source of information because the speed of light makes a difference in these equations. And it's, it's, it's developed a whole industry around this. It's developed an industry now where they're laying cables between London and New York to shave five milliseconds across the round trip time between the two exchanges. So for, for me, this is $300 million spent to take five milliseconds off a trade that exists, that dominates the market because the human mind doesn't think any quicker than 0.65. So for me, when I look at where the really interesting stuff is, I think, well, where does the human brain stop? And where the human brain stops, the algorithms will eventually take over. And that has pretty profound implications, um, not just in technology, but also the physical environment. But in addition to that, I think our relationship with these algorithms is going to be one of the defining characteristics of the economy in the next decade. And I want to run you through some of the thinking that I've been doing about that. So there's definitely benefits, right? Like if you run this, you'll get the bid-ask spread. It'll go down to almost zero. Really, really efficient markets, massively efficient. And it's almost always efficient, almost all the time, except when that happens, right? And those that don't read um, those uh, stock tickers for, for a living, you'll probably know it more like that. It's a flash crash at 245, where collectively the market decided to take a trillion dollars of market capitalization for no real apparent reason. The algorithms got together and decided to remove it and then give it back 15 minutes later a little bit um, unhurt and you know, slightly worse for wear. And they still don't quite know what went on in that period of time, right? The algorithms collectively decided that they wanted to run the world's markets and they decided they wanted to impose their own will on things and they traded um, stock in Sotheby's for $999,000 and, and stock in Accenture for a cent. Maybe they knew something we didn't know, but that's where they got to. And it's because um, if you look at the thinking time, right? The humans, we, we think, um, if you read a scientific journal three hours, Washington Post article, you know, maybe seven or eight minutes, you get down to about three seconds, 140 character tweet, right? But beneath that, you're moving into the sub thousand millisecond, the, the limits of human cognition. At that point, it's the algorithmic ecosystem, right? And this is the, where you're looking, the time for light to travel from New York to London, um, 65 milliseconds. You can execute a trade in about 100 microseconds on the NASDAQ. And now they've got hardware executable chips that'll do 740 nanoseconds to do a trade. Now, a nanosecond, for those that aren't physicists, um, is about the amount of time it takes for light to travel that far. That's why, you know, the position of your servers inside of the, um, the co-located uh, infrastructure is really important. 
they actually actually measure out the cable so everyone has the same amount of cable. But that, that's the kind of the world that we're in, right? And that's what it looks like. We can't see that. Again, that's 900 milliseconds up the top, but that's you know a, a stock being traded by a bunch of algorithms. Um, you know, here's um, what happens. Um, Knight Foundation, not Knight Foundation, Knight Capital um, is a massive uh, trader in this, right? Um, in Knight Foundation moving, that would be strange. Um, but <laughs> these guys uh, run you know, some of the biggest high-frequency trading. And um, they showed up one morning. Um, they were releasing a new algorithm um, into the system, right? They, they, they got this kind of uh, set of servers that they run the algorithms on, they test it, they do all that stuff, and then when they're happy, they release them into the market, right? And they go and trade. Well, they did that um, this morning, and one of the mornings uh, back in 2012. And the market started going a little bit strange, and they knew the market was strange. They didn't know that they were responsible for it going strange. But it was all of a sudden, they were like, the market's weird, and 45 minutes it took them to figure out. It took them 45 minutes to figure out that they'd release an algorithm into the market um, that was never supposed to be in the market. It hadn't been fully tested. In fact, it was the opposite of what should have happened. It was an algorithm that was used to stress test the algorithms that were supposed to go into the market. <laughs> So it was a dummy algorithm that would um, sell high and uh, sell low and buy high, right? Do the opposite, and it got released, and they lost four hundred forty million dollars in forty minutes. And then they pulled the plug, and then they got effectively got bought up for distressed assets at eighty five at fifteen cents on the dollar, right? And it just sort of shows you these things. These are sort of like crazy, right? Like this should, shouldn't happen. But again, this is this is stuff. This is reality. This is going on. And it goes on because we don't think at the speed, but the algorithms dominate at the speed. And again, it's start thinking about, well, what does this mean for our economy? What does it mean for us? So algorithms um, like the night stuff, they read zeros and ones, right? Zeros and ones, basic time series analysis. Really, um, you know, driving the, the quant-driven revolution of financial markets. But they also now are starting to read news, right? They're starting to read not just ones and zeros, but, you know, letters and, and digits. And this is really fascinating because now this sort of stuff happens. This is a bunch of e mini's futures. They're a type of thing that you can trade. And you'll look at the volume there, right? That's the, the total volume. And then you see it sort of stop and get very, very small, right? So the algorithms all leave the market for some reason, right? Remember, the algorithms dominate the market and they all leave. And you think, well, why are they leaving? And they're leaving because there's a scheduled news announcement about unemployment data coming out. And the unemployment data is coming out at 12.30. Um, so all the algorithms get out of the market at 12.25, and they say, I don't know how to read that stuff, so I'm not going to trade. And what you're left with is humans. And the humans read the stuff, and they go, yeah, nothing nothing really significant here. And all the algorithms, they say, push the button, come back in. But you look at it, you think, geez, like the algorithms decide to leave the market. The market's kind of screwed as far as liquidity goes. Um, and that's because, you know, they can't read. But if they could read, what would they do? And that's exactly what they're starting to do, because... In a world where you're competing for the speed of light and the distance that it can travel, the 10 minutes that they're out of the market is an eternity. Huge amounts of time. Remember, we spent $300 million to get five milliseconds on a cable, right? So trading algorithms to read news is going to open you up 10 minutes. What's that worth? So this, I think, is going to be very, very significant over the next couple of years, is algorithms getting very good at reading news. Now, that seems all well and good, algorithms reading news, trading markets. Um, get a machine readable news system, uh, read through an article, a bomb goes off in Baghdad, I'm going to trade the VIX index or I'm going to trade the currency, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be more volatile, I'll make some money, that's brilliant. Until stuff like this happens, right? Um, breaking news, two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. Right? Never happened. This was a hacked um, story um, done by humans this time um, from uh, the AP Newswire. And when that happened, this happened. <laughs> the algorithms left the market. They said, there's a bomb. I don't know what to do. And $200 billion was removed um, from the market. And it came back, and again, the volatility changed. Um, and for me, again, it's like, well, we've got algorithms now being able to read news, not sure what to do. There's opportunities. If they do start understanding it, they'll start trading it. But, of course, if they start reading the news, well, won't they start writing the news? When they start writing the news, how do we believe? And, and what about us? Isn't the news meant for us, right? So we log on, right? We go on and we, we, we think, well, this is again a kind of step back. It's like, okay, so financial markets are gone, right? We don't run them anymore. We can't think fast enough. And algorithms are going to start reading our news and potentially writing it. Well, when you open the New York Times, you open like, you know, the Herald, it takes a little time to load, right? You know, you, you'll notice it takes a few seconds. You blame New Zealand's kind of, you know, shitty internet for that. Um, <laughs> it takes about 800 milliseconds to load. 
And um, you'd be right for the most part to blame New Zealand's shitty internet for that. But you should also realize that 150 milliseconds of that is um, built in um, for an online ad auction that happens. So when you go to the website that takes 150 milliseconds and says, we're going to auction off your presence. We're going to auction off your presence to the highest bidder to show you an ad, yes or no, right? And so there's like a little market that evolves for selling ads backwards and forwards. And I think this is really fascinating, again, because 61% now of the internet traffic is non-human. So the internet's kind of switched the same way as the markets. It used to be the internet was for us, right? We, 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 we had the traffic. Now we don't have the traffic anymore. Um, and it's up from 51% last year or 49% last year. So again, the internet is slowly moving that way because um, there are advantages to being able to think at 150 milliseconds that we simply cannot do. It's not within our biology. So at this point, you kind of want to push the button and say, stop, like, you know, this all seems a little bit complicated and a bit too much. But the reality is we can't really turn back from this. So how do we deal with it? And, and also, look, let's think a little bit about what we're actually dealing with. So, you know, Google and Facebook, you can kind of think of as, right, as kind of having, you know, massive information filtering algorithms, right? Ways to kind of separate information back out to you. And we, we, we think of that and we experience them as products and we think about um, how they do things. But we don't often think about the um, economics, and a large part of the economics of these two companies is electricity. Because you get electricity to store information, right, and retrieve it. And electricity is one of the single largest costs of um, running these two operations. Um, if you flip it back out, what you see is it costs um, Google about $12.90 per user per year, and it costs Facebook about $1.20 to give you the product. I think these numbers are just fascinating, right? That you can have Facebook for a buck twenty. You know, it's obviously if you've got a billion people that can join you on that, <laughs> you can have that. But it's not a lot of money, right, what they're spending on the electricity to give you the product at the end of the day. Um, and that's even kind of, you know, more surprising because you look at things like this. Uh, Wikipedia shows up 85% of the time for the thousand most common searches on Google. You know, in many ways, Google is sort of crawling Wikipedia and it would, you probably wouldn't notice too much of a difference if all it did was give you back results from that. So it's kind of interesting, right, that this, this kind of search and filtering um, mechanism that exists. And I, I think of this because you think about, well, we've got Facebook and we sort of accept Facebook as a social network, but what else could it look like, right? And we say, well, why, why does it look like what it does? And we've got a couple of things here. You take the identity as one axis and you take the history, right? So am I real and do I have to be me online? And if I post something, are you always going to remember it? And Facebook is, yes, you have to be real and I'm going to remember everything, right? And they, they're up there because that's really, really profitable. That's a hugely profitable space to advertise against. But we could also think of one where I don't have to be real and you'd be Reddit, right? You can have your pseudonyms. That's, that's a really different kind of community. Um, we can think about what no history and no identity looks like, right? Does anyone think about that? Well, that's, that's 4chan, right? If you haven't been there, don't go there. You'll ruin your day. <laughs> But it's, it's a really different kind of world. And then, of course, on the other side, real identity, no history, is, is Snapchat, right? So you start to explore the space of different kinds of ways of being. Now, these are algorithms, right? The algorithm is doing something very simple. Do you have to be you, and am I going to remember you? And just by varying those two variables, you end up in a difference between Facebook and 4chan. And the online behavior that we experience through them is night and day. And, and I think it should just kind of reflect on that and think, well, what, what power are the algorithms having on the kinds of interactions that I'm having with the world? And did I want, you know, the all history, all identity, right? Is that what I want? Because that's kind of what we've got. And I think it's coming back and saying, well, how do you design for these worlds? So coming from that, um, I think kind of splitting this out, we've been treated, I think, in many ways as products by algorithms. Most of us interact with algorithms as products. Um, our identities are bought and sold um, online to give us um, advertising that we'll hopefully buy things from. So we've had that, but that's pretty narrow, right? There's a whole lot of other ways that we can interact. Um, we could actually be the owners of these algorithms. So instead of the algorithm serving information in the hope that I might buy something, I could actually own the algorithm and say, well, give me things that'll make me a better person, make me a better friend, make me smarter, make me learn about stuff that I probably don't really want to, but I probably should. And don't try and sell me that stuff. So we could own them. We could be a really different kind of relationship. We could also be on the other side, a sort of techno surf. Well, you can't afford, um, I can't afford to be monetized as a product, but there's some stuff the algorithm is not very good at doing, um, and it's going to offset them to me, kind of little micro tasks on Mechanical Turk. So you can kind of think of being a servant of the algorithms, and that's actually happening. 
But you can also think of augmented intelligence actually driving algorithms, being in a relationship with algorithms as sort of a conversation. Um, you own them, of course, but you're not just accepting what they're giving you. You're actually feeding back and saying, yeah, I want to drive it like I'll drive a high-performance race car. So there's a whole different range of ways of interacting with algorithms. But what we've been given is very, very narrow, and I think to our detriment. This is a graph that kind of struck me as all the, it's my favorite graph for the year um, and kind of what it says, a graph of inequality. I don't know if anyone saw this when it came out, um, but it should worry you, I think, because what it's looking at is the amount of um, income owned by the, the bottom 90% versus the top 0.1%. And you'll see they're just at the point where they're crossing. And you'll also see last time they were crossing was this lovely time period in the 1920s through to 1930. And so for me, this, this, I think, this graph and this rise of inequality, it also jumped out. In 1984, New Zealand was one of the most equal places in the world. Over the last 25 odd years, we have had the single biggest jump in inequality in the world. And so the stories that we had of growing up all equal, I think, are kind of different. But the whole world's moving that way. And I think what I put to you is a large reason of this is because of algorithms. Algorithms are fundamentally making our world more unequal because the information and the algorithms that are operating don't affect everyone equally. And I think this is something to really consider because if you can afford the high-end subscription for an augmented intelligence product, you'll drive and find insight in the market, whereas everyone else who can't won't. You know, the difference between being treated as a product and being driving software to make trades are really, really different and really distinct. So something again to think about. We talked a little bit about Technosurfs. Um, and for those that know, um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk, there's Crowdflower as well as a platform that lets that run. So these are, these are systems that you log in um, and they're called human, uh, human implementable tasks. And you get paid maybe between five and 10 cents um, to do things like determining whether that picture is obscene or not or determining you know, what color this um, object is. Things that the algorithm could do if it had enough money for the electricity, but actually you're cheaper, so I can run with you instead, and maybe I'm not quite smart enough and I can leverage you. And so we've got, you know, Crowdflower boasts they have a million human hours available at any moment. You can access a million human hours to do things at a few cents a pop. Um, things that algorithms can't, or can't do because of cost or can't do because of complexity. Um, this leads to some really interesting um, things. This, this is a performance art piece by Aaron Coblin. Um, he paid people two cents to draw a sheep. I, in New Zealand, you have to have sheep, right? So they got 7,500 people to draw sheep. They got 10,000 sheep. Cost them 20 bucks. And that was great, because then he took all those sheep and created a, uh, an art exhibition and sold, sold each of the uh, paintings off at $20. And then people complained. They said, you can't sell my thing at $20. They said, yeah, you signed the user acceptance thing. So he took what people did at two cents and sold it at 20 bucks. And they were sheep. And people, he said, draw sheep for two cents. Everyone was like, okay. Um, <laughs> which, you know, he, that's, that's why, what, why one of my favorite pieces of art here, right? And it's like, is, is that our relationship with these systems, right? Are we, are we the sheep? Are we creating sheep? Who's getting the value? Where is the value going? Right? And I think you should sort of pause and think about that for a moment. But it, 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 there's actually some really good sheep in there for two cents. <laughs> um, augmented intelligence this is the space that, that I've been working in, um, the kind of the, the human um, coupled with the machine, the centaur. And you can think of a bunch of companies like Palantir, Recorded Future, and IASD all working in that space, creating um, these intelligence platforms that let people interact with algorithms. It looks a little bit... Um, you can kind of think of that there, but it looks a little bit like this. This is the software that we sell. Um, but you can kind of dive in and see it in, in time. And again, go back into the world of space here. What we're looking at is all the, um, all the active participants in the world of the global space industry. You've got um, SpaceX up in top in red, all its first order partnerships that it's done business with in, uh, in yellow and its second order ones there in green. You've got thousands of objects, um, tens of thousands of things. This has all been extracted out from open source unstructured information projected down to a three-dimensional interactive space that you can go and explore and figure out and understand the structure of the world that's around you. So, you know, at this point, it's not like the computer's giving you an answer of like, you know, I predict with probability X what's going to happen with the global space industry. It's actually said, here's um, the information, go and explore it and figure out how you want it to be. Figure out where you want to position yourself. And so for people like NASA who use this software, a lot of it is about trying to understand the structure of how the space evolves and then figuring out how to position themselves 
um, within that space there. Um, another one here is, is um, Occupy Wall Street. You can kind of see um, this time the stories um, unfolding in real time as the uh, political protest, um, protest moves. You can see the stories coming out. And this becomes very, very powerful because you start to think about it as, you know, if I'm putting out stories, where do I want to position them? You know, where do I want my story to end up? Is there a white space in the middle that I can start to connect ideas together to get resonance that no one else is really seeing? And start to monitor that as that goes through. You've got a topology of information that you can effectively interact with and start to understand, you know, how do I want it to change? So we did this um, as sort of a, I guess, a demo about um, 18 months ago. This um, midterm election, we had um, a bunch of senators um, in very close races starting to use the software now from the US political campaigns. And everyone that used the software actually ended up winning their races. Um, most of them are on the Republican side, so I don't know what that tells you. Um, but for the first time, this is actually being deployed in elections. And again, these platforms we talked about, if you have access to this information, you can see more and see further than anyone else that doesn't. And again, you start to think about how that impacts and affects inequality as we drive through this different system. I want to finish on the final thing, which I think has been, um, for me, the most fascinating piece to think about, is this idea of subscription bots. Things that you own, things that work for your benefit, um, instead of being treated as a product. And there aren't really a lot of companies um, around on that. Um, so you sort of have to turn to the next best thing, which is science fiction. And those, um, if anyone has read uh, Neil Stevenson's work, um, there's a book called The Diamond Age. Um, and the, there's, of course, inside of The Diamond Age, there's a book made with nanotechnology called The Young Lady's Illustrated Primer. And it's a book that writes itself. And it writes itself for the young um, woman of the, uh, the story to educate them um, to, to excel and learn and, and be very, very successful inside of the world. But it's a, it's a book that conforms to the, to the reader and kind of makes the story up as it goes along in some ways manipulating them, but in other ways educating them. And I think this kind of idea of a primer for people, a, a, a software subscription that you own that has your benefits in mind, is going to be something I'm going to see, I think we're going to see a lot of as we go forward. Um, we're getting there. Again, if we look forward into actual patterns, this is uh, auto-generation of social status updates. So it's like, Google's patenting is like, I'm too lazy to update my status, but I want people to know that I'm active. So like, can an algorithm do that for me? Um, and you start thinking about, it. again, it's this machines learning to kind of write, machines learning to impersonate humans. And um, you know, we're seeing, uh, I, I tried, there's, there's sort of a, a crude version of this online. It's a Facebook, what would I say? Um, it came up with, you're my valet ticket, which I don't know if that is it either a reflection of the badness of the algorithm or just like, I don't really post things that are very um, sensible. <laughs> But still, it posted that for me, and I was very grateful. Everyone looked kind of confused. I got a few likes. <laughs> um, it gets a little more complex, and this is a bunch of uh, tweets. So those that can't read Spanish is coming out of Mexico City. Um, it's a bunch of tweets here. It's Mexican Twitter bots alleging that a reporter was not killed by a drug cartel. Just think about that for a second. We've got organized crime syndicate pushing out propaganda bots to convince users online that an alleged murder of a reporter didn't happen, right? This is, again, it's not, this is happening today. So we think about this, it's, it's around, it's gonna have a big, big impact on what we do. Here's what those bots look like, and actually if you run the algorithms, you can kind of see it in time, they all come out every 10 minutes, and it's actually pretty easy to see them. But they're evolving, right? This is what happens um, in China. Um, China's got a bunch of these bots, this time it was for around protests that were happening in Tiananmen Square. It's really hard to figure out from the temporal signatures. So they figured out that the, you know, the algorithm, um, the people designing the algorithms are like, we need to get rid of the, the, the temporal signatures of what's going on. So we, we're going to move into a world where algorithms are pretty good at reading and writing, and they're pretty good at understanding who you are, and they can think faster than you, and they can read more than you, and they're going to treat you as products to be manipulated, bought and sold, or you can own them and have them work for you. And I think that's going to be a distinction that we're going to start to move in. And that decision is going to come with money. And some people are going to be able to afford them and they'll do better. Most people are not or can't afford very good ones. You're my valet ticket, right? That could be mine. It would, so people would look at me and say, Sean, you should get a better algorithm. Um, and they're not going to do so well. And so this inequality thing, I don't see it closing because of the stuff. And it's something we really need to think about. Um, and I'll sort of leave you with this final um, piece of that. This is maybe a world that might exist. Um, I hope it doesn't, um, but it's something that we should all really kind of consider and, 
or maybe uh, over the Christmas break as we're having a little bit of time um, relaxing, think about that and how we want to build the companies that we're all going to be building in a world where this is now a possibility. So thank you. <laughs>